And so we are ready for part two. Progressives were, like I say, a, a loosely organized group of people, whether they were ministers or businessmen or women. Uh, it, it didn't seem to matter, but they all seemed to have six characteristics. They acted out of concern for the human beings. And they were very fundamentally optimistic about the human nature, that it's going to get better, right? And But one thing that's different now than has ever been before about reformers is these reformers are willing to intervene in other people's lives to make them better. And it's going to cause some problems, especially when you start trying to intervene in some of your, uh, shall we say, immigrants' lives, because they're very private people. And they were willing to turn more and more to the authority of the state and federal government to help them get things done. But their biggest desire was to purge the world of sins. And they certainly believed in progress and hated the very idea of something being wasted. And they began to join forces. Uh, from different groups from Chicago, New York, San Francisco, wherever they were, they would share information. And they decided that the best way to get things done was to form organizations. Because up at this point in time, you didn't really have any professional organizations. You didn't really have that many standards. I mean, you could say you were a doctor and you never went to school. But the professions of law and medicine, religion and business, teaching and social workers all get together and start forming organizations in their respective fields. And of course, it did begin in the larger cities. And then the leading crusaders are the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And their biggest thing was to try to get the 18th Amendment passed. But the women's movement had really suffered after the Civil War. And they meant it split between the women's suffrage movement, between the ones who wanted a state law and the ones who wanted a federal law. They couldn't make up their mind. But the 19th Amendment was finally pushed through and a women's vote became a reality. Meanwhile, uh, most success law, successful law, laws were limiting women's work hours. Since they had been successful in trying to help things, they, they, now they're actually, it's, it's not really all that good because you're telling a certain person that she can only lift 20 pounds and maybe she's able to lift 50 pounds, but it doesn't matter if she has the capabilities, she is a woman and so she's going to be limited and how much she can do and the work hours that she has. The laws that have been written against child labor are overturned as being unconstitutional because the state or the federal government is trying to intervene in the parents' domain. So they lobbied for government-sponsored reforms. If you can't get it done you know, yourself, go through the government. You start with the local, then you go to county, then you go to state, and if that doesn't work, you go to federal. But they believed that experts could solve the problem. That's all you need is an expert that's going to tell you how to fix something. And the result is a lot of government agencies were formed to help these progressive people get things done. But like I said, there were no standards in the medical field for sure. We had some good doctors, yes, but we had an awful lot of quacks. And a lot of them had no medical training at all. Yet they called themselves doctors and they felt they had the right to tell people how to take care of their bodies, especially women. This birth control movement is going to cause, shall we say, controversy, both social and religious controversy. Because the devout Christians were opposed to it, saying it's a violation of God's law. And of course, the overseers of our moral behavior, you know, the moral police, they were very much opposed because if, if you have birth control available and you have this argument in schools about birth control education or producing or allowing condoms or something to be distributed. It's going to foster promiscuity. Theodore Roosevelt, who was in the president at the time he issued this, but he was very much opposed to any birth control because he said it would mean the death of our race. Because let you let a woman decide to have a child or not to have a child after she gets the first one, she's not going to want to have another one. And of course, all information was banned on birth control. Even the doctors couldn't tell a woman how to prevent a child. And by 1914, 22 states had laws that hindered giving information anywhere. You couldn't put it in the mail. You could, the doctors couldn't even tell you anything. So you learned from your mother's knee, and your mother probably didn't know anything to give you the right information anyway. Now, Irma Goldman, well, she was a died in the world anarchist from Russia. And she was always giving speeches on the philosophy of anarchism, the power of Billy Sunday, misconceptions of free love. 
uh, you can see some of the things on there. The intermediate sex, a discussion of homosexuality. Well, this is something that just wasn't done at the beginning of the 20th century. And then we have Margaret Sager. Well, Margaret Sager is quite a lady. I was looking here for my information on it, because I do have some written down somewhere. And we'll just go with what I've got. She was born in New York City in 1879, and she was one of ten children from a Catholic, Irish Catholic family. Her mother died when she was only 40 years old, giving, trying to give birth to the eleventh child. The father was a heavy drinker, and they lived in poverty, but he was a, had very advanced ideas on what to do. He allowed his children, especially his girls, to become educated and make decisions on their own. Well, she began to associate large families with poverty, and after she managed to finish high school with her father's encouragement, she went to college and became a nurse. Then she did the traditional thing. She got married and had three children. But she was bored. She thought there was more to life than this. There has to be more than this. She moved to Greenwich Village, which was the center of all socialist and radical activities at this point in time in 1910. And she joined the Women's Committee of New York of the Socialist Party. And she began to help support the women's the international women's uh, organizations on strikes. She became quite a radical. And she began to write her newspaper column saying what every girl should know. Well, she was actually writing in the paper the things that the mother should have told the daughter, but didn't. And it was banned. And then she saw a woman die of a self-induced abortion one day. Uh, as a nurse, she'd been called to help a girl who was hemorrhaging. And it seems this girl had tried to self-induce an abortion with a, she used a knitting needle to insert into her uterus and it ruptured her uterus and she started bleeding and of course she's going to bleed to death. And what had happened is she already had five children and she'd gone to the doctor. The doctor told her, if you have another child, you'll probably die. Well, her husband was a heavy drinker and didn't work that much and she was trying to work and take care of the kids and then when she found out she's pregnant, she knew she couldn't have another one so she tried to get rid of it. But the doctor had told her that the only way to, you could tell her to prevent a pregnancy was to have her husband sleep on the roof. Yeah, that's going to work. Well, obviously he didn't sleep on the roof because she got pregnant and died. And Margaret Sanger just got, she was really upset about this. So she began studying about contraceptives. She says there's got to be a way to get information to women, especially the poor immigrant women, how to prevent a pregnancy. In 1914, she wore, wrote a, a journal called The Women, Woman Rebel. And in it, she actually printed out and gave birth control information. She ran for seven issues before the governor, governor realized what was going on and, and banned it. So she broke a law called the Comstock Law. It seems that there was a young man back, oh good gracious sake, back during the Civil War. He, he lived on a farm, so he had he knew what animals did to reproduce. He had seen this happen, but he was he didn't think think too further much further than that. It, it it just didn't seem to go in in one ear and out the other. And one day he was out in the fields watching animals um, cohabitate, and he. Uh, he masturbated. Well, he was so ashamed of himself after he did it that he, he was just, sex to him became a dirty word. He never wanted anything to do with it. But then he goes into the war and he, <laughs> he's in an army camp and he sees these guys playing cards with pictures of naked women on them and talking about the women they've been with and he's horrified at all this loose talk about sex. But when he gets out of the, when the war's over and he gets out of the, of the army, he become, goes into politics and becomes a legislator legislator her and one of the first things he did was get a law passed that would ban any information about sex or birth control or anything else in the federal mails. He also pushed it enough that it, doctors couldn't even talk about it. So it was called the Comstock Law because that was his name. So she broke this law and she had an arrest warrant issued for it but she fled to England to get away from it. And while she was over there she started seeing some of these uh, houses where they helped out the poor and she came to realize that, you know, birth control and sex, it's not really a social issue. It's a medical issue. It should be between a woman and her doctor, not between a journalist somewhere in the newspaper. Well, meanwhile, we get into World War II and she comes back and the government's occupied with the war so they don't pay any attention to her. So she actually opened a birth control clinic in Brooklyn, New York. 
and it was raided, and she spent 30 days in jail. And she appealed, and uh, it went to the New York Court of Supreme Court, and they upheld the sentence. But they ruled that physicians should have discretion in prescribing birth control information. So the door had been opened, and this was good. Now maybe these women can learn something. Late in 1916, the New York Birth Control League was actually published for a law to make doctors able to give information. Doctors able to give information. And yes, she, if you've heard some of the uh, advertisements for the right to life, they quote her as saying a lot of things that she said, but when you take them out of context, it doesn't make any sense. And a group of people called the eugenists so, you know, if we had birth control, it would be a way to control and eliminate the undesirables. We could sterilize people we didn't want to have more children. Well, this is not what she meant when she said uh, more children for women who were in good health and less children for poor women who were in bad health. And it only made common sense because if you're dirt poor and you've got six kids and your husband isn't working, you don't need to have another child. You can't take care of the ones you've got. But if you're healthy, your husband's got a good job and you've got money in the bank, have as many kids as you want to. So that's what she's saying. Really don't have more children than you can actually physically afford to take care of and financially take care of. In 1921, there was a nationwide American Birth Control League formed, finally. 1940, Eleanor Roosevelt, the president's wife, supported not birth control. We changed it now because it sounds so much nicer to say family planning than it ever did to cite birth control. Ms. Sager died in 1966 when just when the birth control pill had been approved by the FDA. Up until that point in time, uh, we had, you had uh, very few, I'm trying to think for a word to be nice, but very few ways to prevent a pregnancy. But this pill it was just coming out in the 60s. So it was in the middle of the, the 20th century, the 1960s, before American women could be educated by their doctor on family planning and actually have a method to prevent a pregnancy. Even the Native Americans got involved in the progressivism. The Society of American Indians, which was founded in 1911, was a typical reform organization. It united Indian intellectuals around discussion of Native Americans' problems and sought to arouse public awareness. And it brought together Indians from many different backgrounds and created what we call a pan-Indian public space free from white influence. And many in the society shared the basic goals of the federal Indian policy, including transforming communal lands on the reservation into family farms. But the group's founder, Carlos Montezuma, became an avowed critic who condemned the government patriotism and demanded the abolition of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. He called for self-determination and for Indians to be granted full citizenship, which they weren't until the 1920s. And progressivism was a worldwide movement. It wasn't just here in this country. And in the early 20th century, cities around the world began to experience similar problems caused by industrialization and massive growth. In 1850, only two cities, London and Paris had a population of more than 1 million. But by 1900, there were 12 in Europe and the United States, which included New York, Chicago, and Philadelphia. And reformers around the world exchanged ideas and proposed new laws and new social policies. And in Britain and France and Germany actually created old age pensions, minimum wage laws, unemployment insurance. They began to regulate safety in the workforce, workplace, so American reformers started to listen to them and watch them and advocate our own social legislation. But progressives through modern society required basic changes in the functions of the political authority. They wanted to know whether to check the power of corporations, uh, protect consumers, civilize the market relations, or, or guarantee industrial freedom in the work workplace. I guess you said they've been influenced by the Gilded Age and the European reforms. So progressives began to, well, they wanted to renew notions of the activist, socially conscious government. They reject the old assumption that a powerful government threatened liberty. They saw freedom as a positive, not a negative concept, in which freedom represented the power of the government to intervene in public and private lives 
to improve society. Uh, hmm. They saw freedom as a positive, not a negative concept, in which freedom was represented in the power of the government to intervene in the public and private life to improve society. Hmm. They wanted to reduce the power of the political bosses. They wanted public control over public works. They wanted to improve public transportation. They wanted to raise taxes for schools, for parks, there should be parks, not parks, and public facilities. Hmm. Now in America, with a decentralized federal system of government, most progressive reforms were enacted at the state and local levels. Now progressives attempted to reduce the power of the political bosses and assert political control over the natural monopolies like gas and waterworks and improve the transportation, as they said. And because state legislators defined the power of the city governments, urban progressives often took reform campaigns to the state level. And the most influential state-level progressive administration was that of Robert M. LaFollette, who made Wisconsin a laboratory for democracy. He served as a Republican congressman, then became convinced of an alliance of railroad and lumber companies controlling state politics. So when he was elected governor in 1900, he passed a series of measures that came to be known as the Wisconsin Idea. Nomination of candidates for elections through primary elections rather than party bosses, taxation on corporate wealth, and state regulation of railroads and public utilities. Ooh. Progressive wanted to restore democracy by returning political power to the citizens and civic harmony to a very divided America. But afraid of violent class conflict and corporate power, they thought political reform would help create a unified people devoted to greater democracy and social reconciliation. But increasing government power made it more necessary to determine who should be able to participate in politics. Hmm. Now some progressive political reforms were contradictory, to put it mildly. The electorate was expanded and then contracted, empowered and then removed from influence in government. Democracy was expanded by the 17th Amendment, which made the U.S. Senators be elected by popular vote rather than by the state legislature for the first time, and by adoption of popular election of judges, and by primary elections among party members to select candidates. Several states even adopted the initiative, which is where voters proposed legislation, and the referendum, where voters directly vote on a proposal, and the recall, where voters could actually remove officials. Like I said, the era ended with suffrage for women, it was the largest democratic expansion in American history. But some progressive reforms also restricted democracy. Noticeably, the what can I say? The disenfranchisement of the blacks in the South. Many localities replaced elected governors with appointed nonpartisan commissions or city managers, and removing local government from the control of political machines, but also popular control. And now we have literacy tests and residencies requirements and registration requirements, and that's going to limit the right to vote among the poor and the immigrant. The progressive electoral reforms marked a retreat from the notion that voting was an inherent right of the American citizenship. And most white progressives were also not interested even in the least little bit in the plight of the American, African American in the South. Now, most progressives were a little bit leery of the real world of politics as it had been, in which people pursued narrow class, ethnic, or regional interest. Now, many progressives thus turned to college professors and other professional experts, like I said, believing that the government could ensure intellectual rule over society through a democracy run by impartial experts, unaccountable to citizens. Wait a minute. Unaccountable. Yeah, that's what I said. Unaccountable. This was part of the progressives' impulse toward order, efficiency, and centralized management as a mean of ensuring social justice. In Drift and Mastery in 1914, a man, a very noted historian named Walter Littman, argued that the nation could either continue to drift, operating according to a dated belief in individual autonomy, or embrace mastery, using scientific inquiry to address modern social problems. 
for he and others, political freedom seemed to rest not in direct political participation, but in the formation of public policy by the most qualified. So here I raise the question, who's going to determine who is the most qualified? The progressives also contained a more democratic vision of the activist government, perhaps best expressed by the women reformers. They're still unable to vote and hold office in most states, but women were central to the movement and the politics. They challenged the barriers to political participation. They elaborated a democratic grassroots vision of government. They were moved to act more often than not with the conditions faced by the poor immigrant communities of the women and children who were working. And of course, the era's most prominent female reformer was a lady named Jane Addams. Now, Adams never married and resisted expectations to become tied to her family as a mother. She was born of an upper middle class and she led a rather sheltered life. Now, back in those days, <laughs> they had something called a grand tour. And when a woman finished her high school and she was about 18 and she would have her coming out party, then she would spend a year touring Europe. That's not for you and me, that's the lower class. We're, this is for the upper class, you know. And then she would go to museums and opera houses and, and see all the cultural things of Europe. And then she was supposed to come home and get married and settle down and be a good mother and wife. And the guy did the same thing, only he wasn't exactly attending opera things. He was attending other kind of houses. And he was supposed to come home and settle down and get married and lead a settlement life. Well, she had this grand tour and she saw for the first time poverty. Now, in London, they had a, that Colony Hall in London where they helped to educate and to help the poor and the immigrant find work and make better lives. So when she returned to Chicago, uh, she met with another lady named Ellen Starr, and they found something called the Hull House. And as I said, she never married. But the Hull House in Chicago was a, what we call a settlement house. It was dedicated to improving the lives of immigrants and the poor. And the workers moved into the poor neighborhoods. They built and ran schools. They ran employment bureaus and health clinics. And they helped women who were victims of domestic abuse. By 1910, more than 400 settlement houses had been established in cities around our nation. Now, this is a picture of her home house and a picture of the nursery where they would bring the children. And here you see a staff member greeting an immigrant family. Uh, Mother Babushka and three kids. She can't read, probably can't speak English. But they're going to take care of the children, and they're going to take care of her, too. And the mothers with baby carriage wait outside to get inside. They didn't live there. They just came during the day. This is an older Adams and Ellen Starr. Now, Adams, I guess you would say, typified the era's new woman. As more and more women were going to college and entering professions and social services and nursing, even, and education. Middle-class women's effort to help the poor and the working women and children, they helped expand government's role in society. Just through settlement houses and other social work, these ladies learned that legislation was necessary for dealing with housing, the income, and health inequalities. Hull House led a number of campaigns for legislation in Illinois or around shorter working hours for the ladies, workplace safety, and union organizing rights. And of course, this inspired others to follow suit. In the South, however, race affected reform as ending child labor was justified as necessary for giving white children the education they would need as members of the South's new ruling race. As I state here, blacks did not benefit. The settlement houses had been called spearheads of reform and they produced a prominent progressive leader such as Julia Lathrop. The first woman to actually head a federal agency, it was called the Children's Bureau, founded in 1912 to investigate conditions of mothers and children and to then to turn around and advocate for them. And then there's Florence Kelly, who organized the National Consumers League to use purchasing power as a way to force manufacturers to improve working conditions, boycotts. After 1900, the campaign for women's suffrage became a mass movement for the first time, and the National American Women's Suffrage Association's membership grew enormously, and its campaign had some success in states, half of which were beginning to allow women to vote in local elections, especially election regarding a school. 
It did win women's suffrage in Wyoming, Colorado, Idaho, and Utah. Between 1910 and 1914, seven more western states gave women the vote. And these campaigns were conducted with a spirit of militancy and used modern methods of advertising, publicity, and entertainment characteristics of a mass consumer society. The state campaigns were costly and increasingly efforts focused on gaining suffrage at the national level. The celebration of women's domestic role actually inspired the suffrage movement. Many progressive proposals emerged from the idea that the state should protect women and children and female reformers formed a movement for improving the lives of the poor mothers and children. Many states enacted a pension for mothers to enable them to care for their children and such materialistic reforms were based on the assumption that the government should encourage a woman's ability to bear and raise children and then allow them to be economically independent. Hmm. Other progressive laws recognized that men and women worked outside the home, but defined them as a dependent group like children that needed state protection in ways male workers were not. In a landmark case called Miller v. Oregon in 1908, and you don't need to remember that, the U.S. Supreme Court accepted the arguments of a Lloyd D. Branches that long hours of labor were dangerous for women whose child-bearing abilities required government protection. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I always found that rather amusing. My child-bearing abilities should be protected by the government. <laughs> and this was the first major breach of liberty of contract doctrine, which had just passed three years after the Lochner decision. But the cause of this what they called Mueller in Oregon uh, was high. And while even more states passed protective laws for women workers, these laws both benefited women and tied them to their family roles. And it also reinforced gender discrimination and exclusion in the labor markets. Although the use of government to regulate working conditions raised questions about liberty of contract, Materialistic policies built gender inequality into the early foundations of the welfare state. Now, Mr. Brandy's imagined a different kind of welfare state from that of materialistic, one rooted in less healthy motherhood than in ideas of universal economic entitlements, which is a right to a decent income and protection against unemployment and work-related accidents. The right to assistance for Brandy's derived from citizenship, not some special service to the nation, as in the case of the mothers. Some states supported that kind of welfare he envisioned, and they passed workmen's compensation laws that drew upon workers' own wages to create a fund for those who were injured on the job. Yet the idea of universal entitlements and protection for all workers, including male workers, would not be expressed until in the policy of the New Deal in the 1930s. The most significant political development of the early 20th century was the raise of the national state nationalization. It was occurring everywhere. National corporations dominated the economy and national organizations like the American Medical Association began to raise the incomes and respect of their profession. Even sports developed national leagues in this period. Progressives believed that only an energetic national government could establish the social conditions of freedom. Poverty, economic insecurity, and the absence of industrial democracy were national problems that could only be solved nationally. Herbert Crowley, editor of the New Republic, argued that the democratic national state was an alternative to the forces that controlled Americans' lives, whether the narrow interests that manipulated politics or corporations. He also suggested that Jeffersonian ends of, quote, democratic self-determination and individual freedom could be secured only through the Hamiltonian means of government intervention in the economy. Huh? So he wants you to be self-sufficient. He wants you to be not manipulated, but he wants the government to take care of the economy. That sounds confusing, doesn't it? Theodore Roosevelt, oh, my favorite, favorite president. If I had to meet anyone, he would be the one I would choose to meet. Theodore Roosevelt was the first progressive era president, and he began to address this question, because he was vice president first. He became the youngest president ever to hold office after an anarchist assassinated President William McKinley in 1901. 
Now, Roosevelt was impetuous and energetic. He, man, he celebrated life. He, he was all for manly adventure. He was daring. And he would become the model for the 20th century president, actively continuously involved in domestic and foreign affairs and setting the political agenda. Roosevelt developed a program he called the Square Deal, which addressed problems of economic consolidation by distinguishing between good and bad corporations. Soon after taking office, Roosevelt shocked the business world by prosecuting the Northern Securities Company, which was a holding company created by financier J.P. Morgan, who run three western railroads that monopolized rail transport between the Great Lakes and the Pacific. And in 1904, the Supreme Court handed the antitrust movement a significant victory by ordering Northern Securities to be dissolved. Roosevelt also believed the president should help settle labor disputes as a neutral <laughs> neutral third party and not act simply in favor of business as had our previous presidents. In 1902, when a strike paralyzed the coal industry, he brought the union leaders and the managers to the White House and he settled, settled the strike by appointing a commission. Well, actually what he told them is they didn't settle it. He was going to close, nationalize the coal as it's in the military, but that's another story. He was re-elected in 1904 and he, then he advocated more direct economic regulations, including reinforcing the Interstate Commerce Commission, whose powers had been a little restricted by the Supreme Court. In 1906, public opinion had shifted in support of Roosevelt and Congress, and they passed what they called the Hepburn Act, giving the Interstate Commerce Commission power to set railroad rates, which is what the farmers had been wanting all along. Now, it was a very important step in giving the federal government regulatory power. And while many businessmen supported the creation of a new federal agency to improve inherit, improve consumer safety, they were a little bit concerned and alarmed over Roosevelt's call for federal inheritance and income taxes and interstate and business regulation. I should have turned this sooner. I'm sorry. This is just what I was just saying. He's been a very busy man. He's also a very avid outdoorsman. When he was a child, and this is linear text, when he was a child, he was extremely myopic, and his father, but he was, he was born of a very wealthy New York family. He was raised very much, you know, with a gold spoon in his mouth, so to speak. And his father gave him a shotgun on his 13th birthday, and he couldn't even smile outside of the barn, so they realized he was very nearsighted, and that's when he started wearing those little glasses that, with a ribbon down the side. And the kids were always picking on him because he was little. So he decided to beef himself up, especially once the kid tossed him off the school bus one day. They just tossed him off and they kept on going. So he took up boxing and he learned how to become a good boxer. As I said, he was also an avid outdoorsman. And when the United States led the world in conserving wilderness areas, uh, he established the first national park at Yellowstone National Park in 1872. Because prior to that, he had no national conser conservation policy until Roosevelt's administration. And he ordered that millions of acres be set aside as wildlife reserves, and he urged the creation of new national parks. Since conservation was typically a progressive idea in many ways. Experts would help the government serve the public good while preventing special interests from damaging the environment. But conservation also served Efficiency and control as conservatism aimed to control the exploitation of minerals and forests on national lands. Now, cont control the exploitation, not to prevent it or forbid it. In the West, water was really scarce and required regulation in order to conserve and distribute it fairly because <laughs> it is hot and dry out there, folks. Unfortunately, his successor, William Howard Taft, didn't always agree with him. But he was Teddy Roosevelt's hand-picked successor. He's the gentleman who was sent to the Philippines to act as the uh, governor. William Howard Taft. He never wanted to be in public office, and he really didn't want to run for office. He was a former federal judge from Ohio, sent to the Philippines to help bring him back. He defeated William Jennings Bryant in his Bryant's third unsuccessful term for presidency. And Taft was a progressive in that he believed government should go beyond laissez-faire or hands-off methods. 
and he pursued antitrust even more vigorously than Roosevelt had. He, he was responsible for busting more trust, if you would, than FDR, than Teddy Roosevelt was. He convinced the Supreme Court to declare John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act and ordered its breakup into separate companies. In that case, along with a similar prosecution of the American Tobacco Corporation of North Carolina, birthed a, shall we say, rule of reason in antitrust policy, allowing the government to distinguish between good companies and bad companies that stifled competition, stifled, stifled competition. Taft also supported the 16th Amendment, which allowed Congress to establish a gradual income tax, thus giving the government a more reliable and flexible revenue source than just dealing with tariff. But Taft, despite his progressive policies, tended to ally with the more, shall we say, conservative wing of the Republican Party. And after a dispute in 1910 with reform-minded officials within his administration, alienated the progressives. Roosevelt's unhappy with Taft. And when Roosevelt decided to challenge him for the nomination for presidency, and when the Republican Party refused to give him the nomination, he formed his own party called the Bull Moose Party. <laughs> and he was a bull moose. So, Taft, Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, and Eugene B. Debs. Now, William Taft is running as a Republican incumbent. Theodore Roosevelt is running as a new party, independent party, called the Bull Moose Party. Woodrow Wilson is running as a Democrat, and Eugene Debs as a Socialist. Now, these are the basic, but the Taft was conservative, and he argued economic individualism was necessary to preserve an individual freedom age. Theodore Roosevelt said the government's necessary to preserve individual freedom, increasing the government powers. Eugene V. Debs, out of my tongue's getting twisted. He supported the socialist goals of public ownership of railroads and banks, but he did want unemployment assistance and laws setting the minimum wage. Woodrow Wilson was a Democrat. The only office he ever held before running for president was as governor of New Jersey. He also believed in the necessity of government to preserve freedoms, but with less government powers. So I guess you could say the difference in the progressives thoughts were very much expressed in this election. Now Taft, although most Americans did not support the socialist revolutionary goals, the proposals for public ownership of railroads and banks and unemployment goals, that really appealed to the Westerner. But the fight between Roosevelt and Wilson over the federal government's role in the economy captivated, captivated most of the voters. And while they both agreed government was necessary to preserve individual freedom, they disagreed about the dangers of increasing government power. Wilson, as I said, believed in less government power. Theodore Roosevelt wanted more government power. And this is Mr. Woodrow Wilson. Wilson, as I said, he had only held one elected office prior to becoming a presidential candidate. He was governor of New Jersey, and he ran on that election. That he didn't have any experience at all, so he couldn't be corrupt. If he looks like a college professor, it's because he was. He was president of Princeton. That's what he was before he got in politics with a college president. And prior, prior to that, he'd been an instructor in college. But Wilson argued that government had to be independent of big business and restore market competition without creating a big government. This program is called the New Freedom. And it involves strengthening antitrust, protecting workers' right to organize unions, and encouraging small businesses. And that way, he hoped to create the condition for a real economic competition without increasing the government's regulation of the economy. I got hung up on his picture, I apologize. To Roosevelt and his supporters, Wilson's program was outdated. It seemed to foster on small businesses, but ignored the inevitable economic concentration and interest of the professionals, the consumers, and labor. Roosevelt's program, the New Nationalism, accepted bigness and the need for a strong government regulation to check its abuses. So Roosevelt proposed heavy personal and corporate taxes and federal regulation of industries such as rail and mining and oil. And his progressive party, the Moose Party, Bull Moose, adopted a platform with many other progressive reforms such as women's suffrage, an eight-hour day and a living wage for workers, and a national system of social insurance covering medical care, unemployment, and old age. 
Now this sounds more like the Democratic Party is wanting today. But this program contained much of the agenda that would come to define liberalism later in the 20th century. Now this is pretty much, uh, the pink is the Republican Socialist, the green is the Democratic, the purple is the Progressive. Looks like the Republicans kind of took the election, didn't it? 82% of the vote. The split in the Republican Party had given Wilson an enormous victory. Anytime you have three candidates instead of two, somebody's going to get left out in the cold. And although Roosevelt came in second, which embarrassed the sitting president, Wilson did become a strong president. He regularly dealt with Congress regarding legislation, and he was the first president to hold regular press conferences. He's also the first president to go to Congress to deliver messages personally. They had stopped doing that back right after the Revolution. The Democrats controlling Congress, Wilson pushed to implement his particular progressive vision. He passed something called the Underwood Tariff, which reduced duties on imports that made up for them with a graduated income tax on the wealthy. The Clayton Act of 1914 exempted unions from antitrust laws and barred courts from issuing injunctions that limited workers' rights to strike. Other laws outlawed child labor, limiting work in railroad to eight hours per day, and gave credit to farmers who stored their crops in government warehouse. He sounds like a very active man, good, good man. Unfortunately, he is from Virginia. I will learn a little bit more about him in the next chapter because he's going to be president when we go to war. He's, um, there's no nice way to say it, he's a racist. He uh, causes a lot of problems because of that. Um, he's not a nice man, although he had a great wife. Some of Wilson's policies seem more in line with Roosevelt's new nationalism than his own new freedom and he abandoned the antitrust for more government economic regulation. He also pushed Congress to create the Federal Reserve System in 1913, which gave government regulated banks the ability to issue currency, help failing banks, and influence interest rates. In 1914, at his urging, he created the Federal Trade Commission, and they were tasked with investigating and prosecuting unfair business activities such as price fixing and monopolies. So by 1916, progressive era efforts had vastly increased the power of the national state. Thus, we're going to end chapter 18 on progressivism, and in the next chapter 19, of course, we get into World War I. But first, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on Wilson next segment, and we're going to see this little YouTube right quick. One of my favorite ladies. Hello, this is Doris Kearns Goodwin, and this is History in Five, and I'm going to tell you about Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and the Progressive Era. Before the Progressive Era, we had this huge gap between the rich and the poor women working in factories, maximum hours not even cared about, no workman's compensation, and nothing was being done about it. And then suddenly comes a movement from the society, led in part by Theodore Roosevelt, helped by these muckraking journalists, to decide that government has to have a role in dealing with the social and economic problems of the age. So as a result, it was a really optimistic, heady time. It was, as a later Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt later said, one of those generations that had a rendezvous with destiny. That's what it felt like. If I could have lived in one of those times, I'd be back in that progressive era. The most important part, I think, of Teddy Roosevelt's leadership was his ability to communicate with his countrymen. He knew how to speak in a language that they understood. He sometimes said, that sometimes my Harvard people might think I'm a little folksy in my language and that I'm not sophisticated enough, but I know how to reach the emotions of the people. And he took these huge train trips around the country for months at a time 
where he would stop at every village station and talk to the people, repeating his mission over and over again. And then most importantly, he had the most remarkable set of relationships with the press. He's the one who defined the bully pulpit, meaning the national platform the president has to mobilize public sentiment and to bring to bear pressure from the outside to force a reluctant Congress to do what it may not want to do. Even when he was having his shaving hour at the White House, he would allow the press to come in and they could ask questions while the barber was trying to shave him. Among the people in the press, none were more important to the progressive era than a group at a magazine called McClure's, founded by Sam McClure, this fabulous, manic depressive, really interesting character who gave his staff, including Ida Tarbell, Ray Baker, William Allen White, and Lincoln Steffen, legendary names in the history of journalism, sometimes two years to research their projects so that they could come up with stories that could mobilize public sentiment. Ida Tarbell writing about Standard Oil. So stunning were her revelations of the unfair uses that Standard Oil had made in order to become a monopoly that it led to the antitrust suit against Standard Oil. And Lincoln Steffens writing about the corruption in the city led to the toppling of a lot of old bosses, people sent to jail, and reform mayors coming in. And together they formed a camaraderie that was unlike any they had ever had before. And they looked back on this time years later, two decades, three decades later, as the most fulfilling time of their lives because they felt they had a mission and a call to change America, and they did. History has known so very little about Taft, mostly only that he followed Teddy Roosevelt and was president, and then Teddy came back from Africa and ran against him, and that they had a very ugly campaign against one another. But the story is much more complex and I think more interesting. They'd had a long friendship, 400 letters written over time, over two decades. Taft was handpicked by Teddy Roosevelt to be his successor. Teddy actually ran his campaign, telling him, fight, do this, be more like me. But then he felt that Taft had disappointed him in not being as progressive as he was supposed to be, and he decided then to run against him in 1912. The issues that were part of the industrial era led to a rift in the Republican Party, a split between the progressive wing and the more established conservative wing. That again, once again, history comes full round. We're seeing a split in the Republican Party now that is being called a civil war, which actually was taking place in 1912. And I suppose the cautionary tale for the current Republican Party is when that split took place, before it took place, Roosevelt was able to contain both wings and get a lot done, win an election, keep the Republicans in majority. Once the split widened and he formed the third party, the Bull Moose Party, then both he and Taft and both wings of the Republican Party lost that election, lost the Congress, lost the Senate. So it should tell the current Republican Party that it's sometimes healthy to have dissent within your party, but when it ruptures to the point where you're yelling at one another and really threatening to leave, then history suggests that it's a tough time for that party. I was introduced to Miss Durbin uh, oh, when I was in undergraduate school. I did a, she's a great historical, presidential historical, presidential historian. And she writes very well. I know that uh, my, my favorite book is the one she did uh, a biography of LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And she went to live with him on the ranch to have access to him. And it, it was really quite well. But that's, we're going to end our chapter 18 right now and uh, take a break. As I said, there's a lot of information from this chapter. Don't forget you have, uh, with both the lectures, you've got the one quiz and, and the two questions and then you've got the test over 15, 16, 17, and 18 and you've got three hours to do it. Uh, read the directions carefully. I didn't ask you anything to, to try to surprise you. I did not try to Give you a hard time. I'm going to be tied up most of the weekend. I will probably not be back on the computer again until Sunday afternoon sometime. But don't hesitate to send me an email if you need something. I will get back with you Sunday evening uh, after the wedding over with and everybody's gone their own separate ways. Otherwise, 
and good luck. I'll see you all on Monday.